The title of this lesson is addressing two questions, really, when it comes to the nonprofit sector, especially social services, if that's you. Hi, this is Craig Morris, and those of us in the nonprofit sector are generally uncomfortable with addressing our constituents as customers, their clients, right? right? Or our patrons, patients, students, uh, and so on. Uh, and note that I haven't mentioned donors yet, and that's something we're going to be covering in this lesson. But we're going to be addressing uh, everyone outside of yourself as your customers today, okay? And we're going to be using customers as a blanket term. So we'll go over that first. Who is your primary customer and who are your supporting customers? Answering each of these questions is totally 100% absolutely necessary for successful fundraising. Successful, efficient, successful. Then I'll introduce you, uh, if you don't already know him, I'll introduce you to the late Peter Drucker and his five most important questions and why you must answer them. And lastly, we'll talk about your customer and what they value. And it's not what you think. So back to this first question I'm posing today. Who is your customer? Nonprofits must decide who their primary customer is, and there can only be one answer. The primary customer is the person whose life is changed by your work. Okay, and this requires great focus. Uh, this is why there can only be one answer. Once you diffuse your target customer, uh, the definition of what that is, you begin diffusing your mission, your work, and you will weaken your impact. The primary customer defines your priorities and keeps things in order for your whole organization and everyone who works there and volunteers there and donates. We'll talk about this more. Uh, and then supporting customers need to be satisfied to best support the primary customer. This is the group your donors fall into, but others as well. Volunteers, members, uh, if you have them, patrons, if you're a theater type organization, referral sources, and so on. They are all people who can say no to what you're proposing or what you're offering. They have this veto power, okay? So let's learn more about what I'm talking uh, by using examples. Here, I'm going to use one of Peter Drucker's own examples. He says, a complex, mid-sized nonprofit organization whose mission is to increase people's economic and social independence. Okay? So Drucker points out that in the beginning, this meant their clients. So that was their one primary uh, customer to be people with a physical disability. So his clients, his primary customer, people with a physical disability, his mission to increase people's economic and social independence, why they exist and who they're serving. I've um, indicated this with the little primary designation. There's a one with a circle over there. That's what I use to do primary and secondary and tertiary and so on. Um, so in this present day, let's say, when he wrote this book was a while ago, but we'll say in this example in present day, this nonprofit includes people with disabilities, but also single parents who want to get off welfare, uh, and uh, people who want to have a chemical dependency, and they want to get off that, older workers who get laid off, they all have these barriers to social independence. So can they not also be primary customers? And this is a question most of you are going to have. Um, we have more than one customer. Well, this is important to learn. Again, remember what I said, don't diffuse your focus. Remember your primary customer is the person with multiple barriers to employment in this case. And each of those persons belongs to that single primary group. Okay? Multiple barriers to employment. So now in fundraising clarity, we're going to take this a little further. I've illustrated this using a Venn diagram, and I've identified our supporting customers here, uh, two, two groups. 
um, probably more, but in this example we'll say two groups. Um, and they're designated with the, the number two. And how they overlap in this scenario. How they might overlap in this scenario. And this overlap has actually been um, the case in organizations I've personally led. Our donors and our volunteers were supporting customers, right? They have a stake in the success of our organization because of their own reasons and values. And we truly know our donors and volunteers because we have two-way communication with them and we survey them, we meet with them, and so on. We know they value supporting our primary customer for a number of reasons, one major one being that improving the lives of struggling minority uh, improves the lives of the community as a whole. Uh, and we learned that through surveys. And as you see, some of our clients became not only able, but willing to become a donor, so they chose to give back. Clients and volunteers uh, and clients and donors here overlap. Clients are giving time, clients are giving money, and vice versa. Those volunteers maybe have become clients, or donors have become clients. So they chose to give back to the organization that helped them. And of course, it's, it's possible some donors became clients as well. Uh, here, there's often pushback, actually, when you, I, when you want to identify your clients as potential donors. But honestly, it's really rude to think and assume that your clients wouldn't want to become a donor someday. And one organization I worked for, we simply laid out information about donating to the organization for people who came in for uh, free uh, medical testing. Now, we wouldn't know if someone came in, someone who came in for a free test, uh, it was confidential, uh, and we wouldn't know if that was who the person was that made the donation, of course, but, you know, they could leave their name or, or uh, credit card information if they wanted to, but the choice was entirely up to them. And sometimes there would be a note attached, um, and they would say they appreciate having the services, the free services available in the community, and here are some, some money as my donation. Another first ex uh, first-hand example I have is when a man in a senior program now we had a program serving senior citizens made a small donation and he was so proud and felt so included to be among the group of people who donated to the organization he loved so much. He felt so included, part of a even larger community. The lesson is don't take that opportunity away from people because it makes you feel uneasy. Let your clients make their own choices as to whether or not they want to give back. And you should probably let your donors know you're there for them when they might need your services, if you're a human service organization, like in this example. So let me illustrate this Venn diagram now to see what might happen if you approach your customers with an open mind, but yet focused on your customers' values. So this is now a representation of what happened for me in the community organization that I actually worked for. The total donor pool grew because volunteers were asked to give and clients were simply given the opportunity to give. Remember, your organization, I mean your customer segments need not be exclusive, but identifying your primary customer and, and who those supporting customers are keeps your organization focused and results oriented. And as such, all three groups are served well. Here's my next example I have here for you. Uh, this is a nonprofit theater. And this is probably what the Venn diagram looks like in all sizes and types of theaters across the world, or at least in the US. Uh, your patrons are those people who buy tickets to see your performances or maybe just one performance. So we're talking about plays, musicals, concerts, rock concerts, symphony, symphonies, and everything in between, things like that. <clears throat> your patrons are your primary customer here. And again, we have volunteers and donors all overlapping. However, in a theater, I more often than not see most of the donors being patrons as well, with a very few donors 
having never attended the theater for whatever reason. They're like a foundation that generally supports the arts in the community or something like that. Uh, oftentimes volunteers love the theater and they want free access, just to be very honest, but that doesn't mean some are donors <laughs> or ultimately become donors because don't know the volunteer handing out uh, programs for 30 years never makes a donation. Uh, I've seen them leave their life savings to these theaters. These volunteers who are handing out programs for 30 years and never make a gift, you don't know. <laughs> they, for 30 years, if, if they're giving that much time, and then they pass away and leave you their entire estate, you never know when they're treated well, that is. So in this situation, you see here, again, uh, you need fundraising and marketing to work hand in hand in this scenario, and this is a classic tension between departments and arts organizations. The the Chicago Symphony Orchestra nailed this a few years ago when a col uh, colleague of mine actually asked him to speak at one of uh, my workshops. He actually came from a very data oriented world. Um, he initiated a marketing and fundraising program he coined as Surprise and Delight. Uh, you could Google this and find out more about it. Anyone in the community making the choice to purchase a ticket to a concert was given a royal welcome from the CSO staff and volunteers, making sure their experience was comfortable and rewarding and letting them know they would like to have them come back. It helps to have a captive audience, of course. So, you know, in the sit theater, uh, situation like a theater, when you know exactly when your prospect's going to be there in where, where they are because you know their seats <laughs> and your prospects um, are located so you can approach them, right? But the success of implementing something so easy that no theater or, or performance organization hadn't really done before with just a, well, some focus, just a little extra focus and cooperation across departments, the Chicago Symphony Orchestra continues to be... Um, one of the world-class orchestras today. So if you're in that theater ever, think about how you can make it easy for your patrons to all become donors. But in a way, so as to not to shrink your number of patrons, if all your patrons are donors, but you had to cut your audience in half, then that's a fail. So remember, your focus on one primary customer and your supporting customers. Okay, lastly, to drive this home for you and give you another example. Uh, this is uh, a group, a primary customer uh, of an animal shelter who is not necessarily, obviously, someone you can sit down and have a conversation with, though a lot of us do. Your primary customer could be babies as well, or an endangered species, members of a future generation. Um, whether or not you have an active dialogue with your primary customer, you must identify your primary customer in order to put your organization's priorities in order. Your priorities and your organizations. Because this is how you have a reference point for making critical decisions based on your organization's values. It's so important. So clearly in this case, your primary and supporting customers don't overlap. I know some of you right now are thinking of ways or <laughs> dogs or cats can volunteer or donate in a certain way. So, well, if you create a self-sufficient animal shelter, though, with no humans, by all means, have at it. But I think it's worth showing that in this case, we want to eliminate any animal needing a shelter. So what do we need? And watch this. More donors, right? <laughs> Maybe we can't reduce the number of animals requiring a shelter to zero, like forever, but with enough supporting customers, we can certainly get close and keep that number close, right? That's why we ask for ongoing support, because there will always be dogs and cats, etc., needing our help. So here's a question for you, and it's a bit of an aside, but I think it's worth pointing out. What image here will help you get the best response when asking for donations to an animal shelter? The sag dog on the left, or the clearly happy dog on the right? 
sad or happy? The answer will show you just how far we have to go as a profession based in scientific evidence. It wasn't until 2017 that some real experiments took place to try to answer this question. To increase the effectiveness of fundraising campaigns in direct mail, many charities will include pictures of their beneficiaries, right? But which is more effective? For example, a sick child who needs the services of a children's hospital? Or the face of a smiling, bright-eyed child? So what the study found uh, was that a picture's influence is dependent on the level of psychological invol excuse me, the level of psychological involvement with the charity. So, in other words, if I've never made a donation before and I see a picture of a dog or child in need, and then asked, I'm more inclined to do something. However, if I've made a donation in the past. I'm more inclined to make a repeat gift if the picture is more positive, like a happy dog or a healthier, happy child. Make sense? So it's kind of like saying that if you ask for someone to give again, they've already given once, you're asking them, will you, will you give again? And then you show them a picture of a child who's still sick, <laughs> and you make them wonder, well, did my first donation even make a difference? the child's still sick. So it's a real visceral and emotional sort of reaction. It's clearly not rational because when you think through, you know, you're not going to say it's true that the hospital doesn't help children, but, but we're talking about um, triggering emotions here. So there's, of course, always dogs and children needing our continued support, and we know that in our head, but if you're opening that envelope in the, or you click on that email and open it, think, are you going to do something that make you want to throw it away? Uh, no, you want to like catch the attention right away or at least continue reading with a chance to give some more thought. So, so that's the point. Um, it's a first, first step. It's, it's the beginning of almost like a funnel. You are catching that person's attention and you want them to keep reading uh, and then make a decision. So you don't want to turn them off by sending a repeat donor a sick child picture. It makes sense. It needs more study, but uh, these are the, there's a growing body of data to support the hypothesis. Okay, I have homework for you now. This is super important as all the homework is in this program. Uh, if uh, you want to succeed, I'd like you to actually pause this video uh, in a moment and take a few moments, at least, to identify your customers. So your, your primary customer and your supporting customers. And then after you list those, you'll go through the mental exercise of asking them, what does the customer value? So I am going to show you right now when you go to the uh, link below this video to download this, you will um, be able to save this to your Google Drive or if you want to uh, um, save it and download it and open it with Excel, that's fine too, but you just click in this uh, D6 box right here to make a copy. Click and then make a copy. Um, and you'll write once again your vis mission and vision. It's important to repeat this and I hope at this point you can type these from memory. And then you're going to go through these boxes here and list out who your customers are. Notice one primary customer and then secondary customers. I've made room for six secondary customers here. Maybe if you're huge or, or a unique organization, you have more than that. But if you have more than that, um, I'd be interested in, in talking with you about um, all those different segments. Now, you can segment donors into you know your major donors and your your members and your um, you know annual givers and that sort of thing as well. But um, 
you take time to think about how that works, okay? So here I'm going to put like homeless people are my primary and then my donors, my volunteers, uh, my staff, um, there, or the other, I have three secondary groups. Um, and we'll go a little bit more into defini defining after you go through this exercise. Then along the bottom here, you'll click on the second tab. They're listed here, your primary customers, your homeless, then your donors, volunteers, and staff, okay? And then below here, you're going to list your customers' values as you think um, they are, and that's fine. It's, you're not talking to your donors, you're not talking to the homeless people or volunteers yet, you're just using what knowledge you currently have about these groups and listing what they value, okay? And then we'll get to the th third tab down here after uh, this, uh, you do the first two parts of this exercise and then I'll explain a little bit more. So pause this video right now, go through this exercise, and uh, once you're done, come back. If you skip this, there's absolutely no reason to continue on with anything else. <laughs> so so uh, take care of this and I'll be right here once you're done. Now take note here. Most organizations are very clear about the value they would like to deliver. You and other organizations um, and others at your organization will make assumptions based on your perspective and interpretation and that's okay. But what's absolutely imperative here is that after you go through this exercise you now compare your assumptions on that second tab with what your customers are actually saying. And if you don't do this step then everything else is hopeless. So what can you do to test your assumptions? Well, the answer is to ask your customer. Only your customer can give you the real answer. So call them, email them, create a survey. This is the only way you'll determine what your customer values. And you do that, they'll feel appreciated. So I wanna go to uh, Peter Drucker uh, and tell you just a little bit about him and why I'm using uh, some of his methods and his five questions. Uh, he was an immigrant uh, to America. He was born in Austria and became known as the founder of modern management. My friend and colleague, Joe Drago, he's the one that really bought me over to Drucker's five questions. And they really do get to the core of any case for nonprofits funding. And I was thrilled when he presented me this book on the left here. It's signed by Francis Hesselbein. And Hesselbein on the right here is a contributor to this book and provides great insight into applying these five rules to the nonprofit sector. Um, she was the CEO of the Girl Scouts of the USA from 76 to 1990. And uh, she uh, became the, then went on to be the president and CEO of the Francis Hesselbein Leadership Institute. Uh, amazing woman, and um, I can't say enough good things about her. And I, here are those five questions. So, what is our mission? So, we're actually going to be um, uh, addressing all of these questions in this program, and we're wrapping them up in our best possible strategies through the following weeks. So try it and test it. So to be clear, your mission says why you do what you do, not the means by which you do it. It must be clear, it must inspire, it must fit on a t-shirt. It's not a slogan, and it's definitely not saving lives one something at a time, or building families one child at a time, or doing one thing at a time. That formula is way overused and doesn't usually answer the question of why you do what you do. It says what you're doing. And also on this question, number one, what is your mission? Never subordinate the mission to get money. 
your focus on your customer and your mission, not the reason why people or a foundation will give you money. Once you do that, you've compromised the very thing you promised to do. If someone is offering a million dollars to do this thing, and it's not something you already do, don't do it. Questions two and three are what we're addressing in this module, and we address the last two among other things in the next. So we'll write our proof of case, but on question three, you need to make sure you work through before you go on to the next lesson. What does your customer value? If you're having any trouble here, I'm going to give you a starting point. And you can go back to your worksheet and continue to refine. I can tell you right now, your customer values an organization that asks for their feedback and helps solve their problems and meet their needs. So if you assign any values to your customer, put something like this. Then you'll know what to do next. Even if your primary customer is animals, I'm sure they'd value your attention to the needs uh, in their safety and their security and their health and their love. Um, and what we're doing in our nonprofit, if we're not challenging, what are we doing, I'm sorry, in our nonprofit if we're not challenging business as usual? Most of the time, if not all, our nonprofit exists because there's some kind of business as usual being challenged, right? So your courage to do that, not just with your mission, but in your overall work plan will be appreciated and valued by your customers, including your staff and your volunteers and the board and everyone else. Even from those resistant to change, and I know they're there, eventually once they see the positive outcomes you promised come true, they'll come around. Knowing what your primary customer values is of utmost importance but holding the values of those supporting customers is of equal equal value. If you're to be the leader who brings together all the resources together to bear on accomplishing your mission, those resources being staff, volunteers, talent, and money, you can't operate a nonprofit organization without at least some money, and that's why you're here. So ask yourself this question several times, okay, over the next days and weeks. Write it down, pin it up, and of course, ask your donors. What does your donor value? Like any customer, your donor also has veto power, okay, right? They can choose to not engage, to not buy, to not donate. And unless they perceive value and then receive value, they will not give or continue to give. And they will not recommend others give to your cause either. This question, it's a linchpin to everything here. So work on this. Ask yourself, ask others, what does your donor value? You will need this to move on to the next lesson. Or otherwise, there's nothing to pull your proof of case together. That's the third tab that's in that workbook. That requires more work. That requires completing those first two tabs, which you've already done, and then testing those assumptions by going out and asking. So thank you for being here. I'll see you uh, after you answer this question as best you can in uh, the next video.